I think you're on mute, Rian. Uh, there, I made the classic mistake of being on mute. That's a good start, isn't it, Ash? <laughs> it's Friday. It doesn't really matter. I was about to say welcome to those watching us on LinkedIn. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is another session, the last one for the week in our series here on Ribbon for Travel. And um, Ash, you've been instrumental in bringing this from a US perspective. So thank you for doing that and bringing in some experts on your side, which we'll get onto stage in a minute. How are you doing? How's your week been? It has been a good week, uh, very, very busy. Uh, we spent some time planning for this session, so I'm super excited to talk to our guests today. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, yeah, I mean, from our side, the Ribbon for Travel has been absolutely, I think, you know, very humbling, but there's a very strong word that's coming out of this week as the theme, and that's this togetherness. You know, it's, it's just this camaraderie in the industry that people want to, work together and and set aside differences and set aside competitiveness and just make sure that everybody in the industry is okay and it's been absolutely fantastic to see yeah um you know i kind of feel similarly i think that the one thing i mean you know put aside the impact of the pandemic but i think from a travel industry perspective i've never seen this industry in 25 years come together like we have i mean we have those little um you know spikes uh doing something like 9 11 and other things like that but those are short-lived right this is kind of a long period of time so i've seen a huge um change in people and it's really been very very impactful um well i want to first of all congratulate you rian on starting ribbon for travel i think it's a great initiative. I think you've done a fabulous job. And, you know, just to kind of share with our audience today, what do you, you know, how did you come up with this idea? Well, thanks, Ash. Um, it's not my idea at all. I had a long discussion with this lady who was on the on the management for travel and a few other sessions as well, Rebecca or Bex, as she's known in the industry, Bex Deadman from Blue Cube Travel. She's actually got her title on her profile that she's, you know, she's she's definitely determined to to end the stigma about mental health. And we had this long discussion with her, and I did on the phone. And when I put the phone down, I just realized someone has to do something about this, even more so than what has been done already. I mean, there's not to 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 make the other efforts that's been done on this um, any less important. But I just thought I can also contribute. I know how to build websites. I know how to do this sort of thing. So. Um, you know, great connections on LinkedIn. Let's let's get the show on the road, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So, um, how many sessions did you have? I saw tons of sessions on the website from an agenda perspective, starting Monday morning this week. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, um, obviously you got the invite. You've uh, heard about the event maybe through LinkedIn, but you definitely want to check out ribbonfortravel.com. Uh, this is um, this week has been declared as uh, Mental Health Awareness uh, Week in the travel industry. So. Um, there was tons of sessions. So how did the sessions go? Give us a quick recap. Please. Very good. We had some mixed sessions. So we had an open Zoom call every morning. Um, that was just a drop in, come and have a chat and, you know, drop out. And the best thing about that, it was just people chatting, just catching yeah. up, just saying hi, just saying, you know, how are you doing? So that was fantastic. The actual structured sessions like these ones we're doing now were enormously you know great and we've just decided that every one of these will will take the recording of it and put it on the ribbonfortravel.com website so if you're not here now you're missing this you can also see it later great great well i'm super um excited to be part of this um initiative with you and you know um as we have talked about earlier you know i'd like to see uh, you know, this go on for, you know, I know, I know this is the week of, of, of making it um, official, but I think that there is a lot of uh, opportunity for us to help people in the travel industry beyond just this week. And I'm um, really excited to be part of this with you. And if there's anything that I can do to improve um, things, I would definitely do it. Um, and I'm also very proud that we are doing the finale finale session. Today. Yes. You um, have the... so, uh, <clears throat> so we're, we're closing out the session for you. That's right. And, you know, that sentiment you've just echoed there, we've also seen from so many companies stepping forward. So the the, the ribbonfortravel.com website will remain alive for the whole year. And um, we're going to use it to provide resources for people to come to and, um, you know, use and to help them, you know, get through a difficult time or just find the next job or whatever it is they need. And uh, I think um, 
that's just been such a sentiment from the other companies as well that they wanted to be part of it and people have been shouting out how can i help you etc also want to shout out to daniel and andy who's been very instrumental in helping me with this and supporting me so it's been it's been really good so what i like about today's session ash is that you're going to run it and i can let my voice rest so i'll be in the control room well you're, you're, you're not you. going to rest too much you're going to be working behind yeah. the scenes today that's so okay thank that's you for okay. that really appreciate no worries. that all right so i'm gonna um, i'm gonna exit and let you introduce your guests Great, awesome. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Rian, appreciate that. And uh, for all of you that are joining today, just a couple of housekeeping rules I wanted to share with you all. Uh, while you're watching today's session on LinkedIn, you can use the comments box uh, that should appear on the right side of the window there. Um, ask questions, uh, give you suggestions, comments, anything you'd like to do. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, you know, we'll try to give you some immediate um, uh, answers uh, with the speakers today. Uh, and if your LinkedIn profile is not locked, others will be able to see your comments. Otherwise, uh, you know, um, they're not going to be able to see your comments, uh, but we can. So um, I think that'll be okay as well. And on that page that you're on, where you logged in for this session, we do have a poll. Um, so feel free to answer that poll if you would like. Uh, we'd love to get some input and feedback uh, for our speakers today. Um, and that way we can um, uh, we can get you um, a little bit more information as you as you need it. So uh, with that, I'd love to introduce um, and welcome my uh, esteemed speakers. Um, all of three of them are veterans in the uh, travel industry and in the recruitment area. So I think all of you are in for quite a treat. Uh, so let's have them come up on the screen here. Um, uh, and I'd like to welcome them. We'll go in um, in, in order of um, of uh, alphabet. So uh, now we have to like think a little bit, right? Where, where's the alphabet start? So with that, um, Gail, um, uh, welcome to the session today. Really appreciate you being part of it, and thank you for committing your time um, and your energy and insight uh, for all our guests and all our listeners today. Uh, so would you kindly share a short introduction of yourself? Yes. Um, hello, Ash, and everybody here. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, actually, I'm a little bit nervous, even though I'm on the screen here. I've actually done some speaking in front of people, and I feel like I haven't done this in so long. I'm like, Ugh. anyway, thank you so much. I think this initiative is a wonderful, wonderful initiative. And Rian, I've been following him on, on uh, LinkedIn for a while now. So when this came about, I was just like, yes, I'm definitely in. So again, thank you so much. Um, I've been staffing the travel industry for about 31 years. Uh, many people who have known me out there know I've been around for a really long time. And um, I, I used to say uh, my biggest claim to fame is if you're looking for a job, my name would be scribbled on a bathroom wall at a reservation center. So I don't know that that's a good thing or not, but it's certainly you know a little bit fun. So um, I do uh, temporary permanent staffing and we actually have our own job board for the travel industry called hottraveljobs.com. We have um, resume writing on there. We have um, Sabre personal trainer on there. So if you're uh, looking for something, certainly just check it out. So that's about awesome. Me. Awesome. Thank you for that, Gail. Um, so G A G I. Okay, Gina, you're next. Uh, welcome. <laughs> you have and, to think um, about that. <laughs> well, you know, a little bit of effort required on a Friday morning. So thank you uh, for being here, Gina. Really appreciate you. And you're coming in from uh, the wonderful state of Texas. Um, I think. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, let the audience know um, uh, a little bit about you. Thank you, Ash. So I'm Gina Tedesco, Travel Search Network. We are based in Dallas. My colleague, Paul Erickson, is listening on LinkedIn Live. Um, we have both been here since 87. The company's been in business since the early 80s. And like Gail, uh, and we work in partner with Gail, we specialize only in the travel industry. And we know the industry unlike, you know, general recruiting companies or general placement companies. So it's, uh, we have a much better relationship with our clients because we know what they need. So that's about it for us. Um, and we just, uh, I, again, like Gail, we love what we do. That's why we're still here and we're blessed to still be here through the pandemic. Great. Great. Thank you for that. And Michelle, on to you. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, Michelle Delgado, longtime uh, travel industry veteran, as Asha said. Uh, Gail and I know each other for more years than we want to mention, because that would make it seem like we started at 12. So we're going to keep it at that. But uh, yeah, I have been uh, I started out in operations, worked my way through the through the ranks and uh, impacted last year, but still connected to the travel industry and so happy to uh, be here with 
um, with these lovely ladies and Ash leading this conversation today. I love when I have a room full of powerhouse women. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> so, like satisfying to me. Makes you so look many so ways. good, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just come on and all you guys do the hard work and I'm just, uh, you know, the reason why people showed up is my good looks, I think. So, um, exactly. thank you for that. Um, Gail, by the way, um, somebody is asking about your website again. Can you go ahead and just mention that one more time? It's, um, it's hottraveljobs.com. Great, great, okay, there you go. All right, um, so let's go ahead and uh, kick things off here. Uh, now that our audience knows you guys a little bit better, um, if they haven't heard of you before, now they do. Um, and Rian, if we can, yeah, perfect, thank you so much. Uh, so a, a little bit about, um, I wanna kick off the session today with some travel industry headlines uh, discussion, right? Because uh, you know, there's been a lot going on and the last 18 months, I mean, it's almost impossible to start a session without talking about the last 18 months for whatever reason. And uh, hopefully it won't become 24 months. Uh, but, uh, but I would love to uh, just kind of, uh, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the travel industry headlines. And, you know, we've gone through a roller coaster, right? Uh, first, uh, we're gonna, things are gonna get back to normal, then things are not gonna get back to normal. Uh, travel industry, of course, is experiencing severe, severe um, loss of revenue um, and business has changed forever. This dramatic um, and really amazing, uh, you know, companies coming together that we never would have thought would be together, uh, like Amex and Agencia, for example. Um, and now most recently, we're seeing a change in, um, in some travel patterns with the UK being approved and the US approving travels from the outside. So, you know, I kind of feel like we're going up and down and up and down and finally, we're going up again. And we're like, yay, we're gonna we're gonna make it somehow over this hump, right? So, so Everybody in the audience is experiencing, I think, fatigue, right? And um, experiencing this um, uh, lack of awareness and is just like, when is it going to be normal again? And, uh, you know, this is the context at which we are. And, uh, you know, it's really, really difficult um, for, uh, for, for everybody to just kind of figure out what to do next. And, you know, where is the future of the travel industry going to lie? And how can I play a role in it? I mean, traditionally, we've been doing something different um, moving forward. Um, we might have to reinvent ourselves in some sort of way and and apply ourselves to the future of the travel industry because things are just not going to be, in my opinion, the same as they used to be. And of course, all of you might echo my sentiments there. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, I mean, Gail, Michelle, Gina, feel free to chime in. You know, what have you been doing during the pandemic? Like, I mean, you know, I mean, no one was hiring for a long period of time. What was going through in, I mean, what, what were you doing and what were you um, dealing with uh, when all of this was going on, let's say in the first year? So I would love to start with that. Yeah. So as, as everybody's offices were shut down, we weren't supposed to come into the office. You know, Paul and I love being office based. I, I'm not a virtual person. We came in every day. We reached out to our clients. We reminded them that we were here. Anything we could do. Um, and it's it really played a key role in our survival from a mental state. Because like you said, it's a beat down. We had a tough time. What are we going to do? What's going to happen to our small business? We've been hit in so many different ways, but we, we, we persevered and kept moving on. And honestly, Ash, I'm telling you, every day, checking in, emailing, calling, what's going on, don't forget about us, we're here, and, and, and as well as reaching out to our candidates, letting them know we're not going anywhere. It's a tough time for everybody, but we're all in it together. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's what helped us get through it. Uh, but that was our primary focus was just staying in touch with everybody. We didn't sit at home and feel bad for ourselves. We just got out there and and just, you know, hit the ground running with it. it. It took a long time for things to come back, as we all know. But they're slowly coming back. And we're now working with companies that we've never worked with before because our, our, our prior clients went to work with these new companies. And they thought, oh, wait, we got we, we to gotta call Gina. We got to call Gail. So it works and just staying in touch with, with, with people and networking was key for us. I think a lot of what I did was more of a, <clears throat> you became a rah-rah person and a shoulder mm -hmm. for these other people that were out there. I mean, on the um, Facebook pages, I mean, don't forget our industry is, we've all been in it for, you know, 30 or 40 years or whatever. I mean, we grew up in the industry, you know, and then all of a sudden everything came crashing down. You know, and when you're in your 50s and going into your 60s or whatever, you're like, you're not ready to retire, but this is the something you've done all of your life, you know, and you're like, okay, what am I going to do? You know, a lot of people were just totally shocked and just wanted to almost jump off of a bridge, you know, um, 
but you kind of had to talk them down and say, listen, you know, the travel industry is resilient. I mean, going through, you know, 9-11, going through 2008 economic downturn, granted, this was certainly much worse than that, but the industry is resilient. Business likes to do business. People like to travel. And it's not something that you can just automatically say, we're never going to do it again. It's going to come back. Yes, the landscape may be different, but I mean, we have lost so many people in the industry every time between 9-11, between 2008. We've lost a lot of of, of our corporate travel agents to begin with because they left the industry. So it will be back. It will be changed. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer. I'm also a, I, I'm also with a plan B, you know, I tell people, listen, you should always have a plan B, have a backup, you know, do something other thing is on the side, you know, keep your, keep your mind going is sitting there and doing nothing is really not an option. You have to survive. And that's the art of survival. So that's, um, you know, as I said, it became more of a rah-rah person, you know, just to cheer people up. So, and I certainly had my ups and downs as well, still do. So, well, were you, yeah, were you playing the role of psychologist into to many people at some point? Oh, right? absolutely. I mean, just, absolutely. I mean, they would call you, right? And say, hey, Gail, you placed yeah. me in this job six months ago. I'm out of a job. You know, what do I do mm -hmm. now? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, you're absolutely. You're I think we, I think we all did that. Michelle, Jean, and I, we, we played, we did, we have played psychologist to people that were just like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, um, I I say, you know, this industry is, it's so big, you know, whether you're doing, you know, corporate travel or leisure travel or hotels or car rental, whatever, it's a huge industry. And sometimes we box ourselves into a little area. We need to go outside of that box, you know, um, leisure travel, leisure travel has grown in leaps and bounds. There is 30, 30 or 35,000 independent contractors the Travel Institute said they had more people enroll into their programs last year than any other year ever. So um, it became, you know, people took their their fifteen hundred dollars they got from the government and they invested it. They they took a travel course, believe it or not. But there are so many people that are in leisure travel. So you know, I mean, and what did they know? I mean, we're sitting on the other side saying, "Oh my God, it's never going to be the same." But they're looking at things differently. They're looking at things as like, "Hey, travel's a great business," you know. So, okay. you know, um, it's just uh, became we did become psychologists for a lot of people, though. You know. Go ahead, Michelle. I think you were going to comment on something. Yeah, um, to Gail's point, we definitely were there to support. Um, I met some of the most amazing people through uh, last year. Uh, when we were all impacted and it was just about a wellness check to make sure that people were, you know, what is it that they needed today, whether it was to support them and, hey, can you look at my resume? Am I missing something? Um, you know, I got this job offer. I'm not sure. And so a lot of what I ended up doing was reinventing myself and started to really focus on even at just a just naturally just doing some career coaching for themselves and for myself and and reinventing um what is what were the possibilities for them you know taking those transferable skills and seeing how they could be applied to other industries and um just staying in touch with people you know and i was grateful that i had the same amount of support so it was it was really needed. Yeah, um, and uh, and I think that you know uh, uh, somebody commented that you know it's not just travel advisors that lost their jobs. You know, marketing departments and all sorts of support services all were severely impacted. So we definitely hear you, and I think everybody here agrees uh, with that comment 100%. Um, so with that being said, right? Uh, you know, what, did you see a change in? in the type of resumes or what companies were looking for uh, as it related to the jobs that they were trying to uh, find now that, you know, we're kind of in a little bit of a recovery mode, so to speak, right? Um, has there been an evolution of the job type or the resumes that you're getting? Um, uh, and does that correlate with each other or is there a total disconnect? I, I think there is somewhat of a disconnect because a lot, what we're seeing in Texas is more office-based positions, believe it or not. Um, we have not we've not seen the so-called normal corporate virtual jobs come back like we thought they would. Honestly, I thought the temporary business would come back first. You know, they'd kind of test the waters and then decide, okay, we're ready to bring people back permanently. So again, the landscape that we've seen change is, you know, they want them office based. Um, I want them in my office. Virtual is not an option anymore. We want to kind of see and manage 
hands on. Um, the resumes, we can get into that later, but that's in a whole nother uh, subject to talk about. Um, we've also seen some other type of hospitality positions become available, you know, uh, accommodations, crew movements, things like that, as well as, you know, if the virtual positions, when they came available, there are a lot of after hours, overnight, weekends. So you have to be flexible. It's understandable if you have a small, you know, a young family, but flexibility kind of is the name of the game right now. Yeah, kind of the hard reality of, of, of the situation, right? Yes, very Michelle, much. Michelle, any comments on that? I saw that a lot of people um, switched from either, you know, what they did previous to travel and were a little reluctant to go back to a, a former career or a skill. Um, and some of the conversations we had were, you know, travel's not going anywhere. And so maybe this is the best time to take care of you and your family to do something else while it continues to heal and then come back, you know, reemerge. Um, so that was interesting. But I also saw a lot of people who went from travel to real estate. I, I, yes. it's so funny so because that was like a natural, <laughs> okay, I'll go sell homes now since I can't sell tickets or can't sell travel in some way. They've done that for, they've done that yeah. for years. That's been going yes. on. So, um, it, it was interesting, uh, to see how people just started to get really creative, including myself, you know. I've seen, um, I did a poll uh, recently on the for, on our um, uh, networking Facebook page for um, mainly for corporate travel. And um, basically we're gonna see that 30%, roughly between 25 and 30% of the tra travel people are not gonna come back to the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so- Wow, that's yeah. a big number. It's a, I know it's a big number. And that's why we did the poll, you know, because a lot of people have left the industry. They have, are picked up by, um, you know, whether it's Verizon or Comcast or, you know, some of these other companies that look at the skill set, you know, of a corporate travel agent. I know we keep saying corporate travel agent, but, you know, they were affected tr tremendously. I would say on that Facebook page, it was like 45, 4,500 people at least, you know, mm -hmm. that were affected by by this downturn. And so, you know, they, they're, they're finding jobs elsewhere and some of them are happy, some of them are not so happy, whatever, because they really miss their travel jobs. But, you know, I say that a good 30% we're going to, we're not going to have. Um, and I think that travel agencies will probably be as things return, you know, we might be back into the same situation that we were in trying to find people, which is, which would be nice. But um, I, I firmly believe that I really do. You know, as time goes on, we're not going to have the we're not going to have the resources. Okay. So, yeah. Right? So 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 what's happened to salaries? Um, just kind of like a high level uh, picture here. You know, our salaries. I mean, for the same position, are you seeing the salaries? If you were to go into that same role that you pre pandemic, post pandemic, is there a salary difference now? Are salaries lower than they um, used to be? It, well, no, I mean. Basically, we're working on a position, Gina and I, right now for uh, something in, in New York and really is the same salary than what it was um, pre-pandemic, okay? So salary-wise, they are still roughly in the same ballpark. Okay. I, I think more so that um, companies with their existing employees, some of them have not brought their salary levels back up to where they were before. Right. Um, had people reach out to me and ask me about those that type of situation or the, asking me what I what I've seen, you know, in companies bringing their salaries back up. So I've had some complaints about that uh, okay. for sure in terms of salaries, but I think we'll, salaries are about the same. OK, and we'll share some tips a little bit later um, about um, how you can negotiate that in the right way. Right. Um, I believe that's one of our things that we're going to share a little bit later. OK, so with that, um, let's go ahead and. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, give the floor to you, Gail and, and Gina and, um, and Michelle, feel free to chime in. But, you know, we want to get into some of the resume tips. Um, so feel free to, um, Rian, if you can get that up on the screen, that'll be great. Um, now, some of these things are obviously, uh, you know, uh, what we know. Hey, that's a great thing that recruiter's office is. Phone I, my phone's ringing. I just, I just like, it. oh my God, what am I going to do? My yeah, phone's ringing. That's okay. That's okay. We're, we're live. So things like this will happen. Um, but, um, but you know, I mean, obviously there's things that people know about. She's taking a call. I love it. Oh, this is awesome. Okay. <laughs> what the 
anybody that was else great. Did. That was great. I've <laughs> never had a session where somebody answered a call in the middle of the session. <laughs> this is amazing. Well, it's okay. either that or it was going to keep ringing or I could hang up on the person well, or no, you keep calling. I know. Calling I know. Them, so. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. I just so, didn't know what to do. So some of the things here are, are obvious things that we all know. I mean, you know, people who've been in the industry who've filled out, who've done resumes. You know, there's many people who have not looked at their resume in years, okay, that are finally, you know, dusting off that um, electronic paper, uh, wiping it down um, and kind of cleansing it up. So there's a few things that have changed, but, you know, please, um, Gail, go ahead and um, take the okay, lead and, so, and give us some so things. On your, so now. basically on your resume, obviously with your full name, you know, if you're married, if you're newly married or whatever, use your ma married name and your maiden name because some people might know you by that. Um, I think the important thing is what we're seeing these days is that people are not putting their addresses on their resume. Um, you know, simply because they think that they're going for a for virtual job. But understand this is that some companies don't work with people in various different states uh, because of tax reasons. So um, even though you may be applying for a virtual position, you need to put a complete heading on top of your resume, which would be your name, your address, your cell phone number. Even one number is fine. You don't necessarily have to put two numbers on there, just the best number that you could be reached on. Um, your email addresses should basically say, um, you know, be professional. Uh, you, I've seen some, I've seen some, and I think Gina will agree with me that it's just like unbelievable as far as what people put down on their, Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, for their, for their email addresses, you just really have to chuckle. Um, if you have a LinkedIn contact, put your LinkedIn contact down there. So, um, so those are basically very, very important things and make sure that everything is correct. I've had people put down wrong cell numbers and I'm calling somebody else. So, um, so those are things that are really, you know, very important at the top of your resume. So, okay. Um, let's see. How about the next slide here? I, I have a question. What you does it mean? Question? Yeah. What does it mean to have a professional email address? Like is Hotmail professional? No, no, no. Like you wouldn't want, um, you know, uh, Dolly's, you know, uh, something, you know, like whether I don't cakes.com cute at AOL doesn't work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, um, so, so, so like pet names, like, like yeah, that. Yeah. Not professional. Yeah. So it. professional, I mean, Hotmail's fine. Gmail's fine. It's not the end part. It's the beginning part, you know, mm -hmm. that you just, you know, want to said, you know, I love to travel at uh, gmail.com. You know I mean? That's just not like, I don't know. You're, you, you kind of want it relative to you and not, Broad, right, Gina? Yeah, I 100% agree. Okay, all and right. If I could just chime in there, um, the difference because I have a child who's a millennial. If you use Gmail, it shows you know you kind of get away from that whole ageism issue because if oh. you have an AOL or a Hotmail, absolutely, it shows that you've been around for a number of years. So, okay, uh, it's recommended to use a Gmail. Yeah, I've actually, I, actually, I did that too. Um, you know, I'm a, I love Hotmail, by the way. Um, I'm old school. <laughs> I kind of think of it as vintage email addresses, right? At some point, Hotmail will become cool again. So I'm going <laughs> to hold on to mine. Uh, but, you know, you, you kind of need to have, I mean, you can't have AOL. You can't have Yahoo, I think. I think Gmail is kind of considered to be the industry norm. I mean, Fair? I still have an AOL account. I still have AOL. Oh, I'm not grief. applying for any jobs. Don't tell me when that goes. Good grief. Good grief. Okay. Everybody knows it now. All right. All right. Continue on. Sorry for that. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. So, um, Gina, do you want to go take this one now? Sure. So, uh, resumes are key. That is the first thing that they're going to see and, and decide if they want to bring you in for an interview. Don't be lazy. Show your work history. Don't go back too far. Nobody needs to know what you did 20 years ago. It's not relevant. They want to know what you've been doing the last 10 to 15 years. That's your relevance. Don't be redundant. Make sure they're correct. People will send me resumes that I placed 10 years ago and they have the wrong information in my database. I'm telling them what they need to put on their resume. The key is, though, is don't be lazy. And that's the problem. People are lazy with their resumes. It, it, it's so important right now to have a great resume, um, to use your bullets. Don't write, a, don't write a story about yourself. Use your bullet points. Talk about if you were a VIP agent on a financial account, put that on there. Um, if you were an account manager, how large was the piece of business that you managed? What kind of revenue did you handle? 
going back, I'm going to flip back and forth between that and corporate agents. So if you're a corporate agent, you know, do, where you want a multi-million dollar account, um, from an account management standpoint, you know, how big was the account, the revenue that you handled. And then ultimately guys is the, the technical and the software skills. They want to see it. How proficient are you with concur? How proficient are you with the GDS with, with word PowerPoint, add that on there. If you don't know it, learn it. There's lots of free opportunities and free trainings out there now. Um, but that is the thing for me is, is, is key is just don't be lazy the information on the resume don't go back too far nobody cares when you graduated high school or what you did 20 years ago we're all about the same age <laughs> so um you know college um very important and your technical skills very important so um, we, have a, we have a question from the audience that i'd like to uh, bring up from bonnie um she's asking about a comment that we made earlier um, is it okay just to put the city and state versus the full street address if you don't want to share your street your, your street address with uh you know at the resume point absolutely yeah, just put exactly. city and state city and state is fine mm -hmm. i mean okay. we get it you don't want everybody knowing exactly where you live and whatnot <laughs> you know, if you google your name and everything else a lot of times everything comes up there anything i mean Believe it or not, you can find out so much on Google. Um, and as far as I want to add um, to what Gina just said, you know, your summary of accomplishments, you know, to summarize your accomplishments, yes. accomplishments on a resume are so important. You want you want this resume to basically, you want to look at it and say to yourself, wow, look at me, look what I did, look at my accomplishments, look at my achievements. And I understand that trying to remember these things like is so hard to do, you know, I, you know, we have a resume writer through Hot Travel Jobs and he's president of the Resume Writers Guild and he's he's very good. He's done a lot of resumes for us. There's also some, I think there's live career. Um, I think my daughter just used that, which is an online program, which actually looks pretty interesting. It's called livecareer.com um, if you wanted to do something yourself. But the bottom line is that your resume is going to get you in the door if it has all the proper information on it which correlates to a job description so i guess we're going to get into that in a couple minutes but um you know your resume is just so so important and to throw something together you're not going to get anywhere with it you you know because the, the competition out there is fierce and if somebody else has a better resume than you and background they're going to get through the door first so so it's just extremely important and I would put a lot of work and effort into it and don't be lazy and make changes as you see fit. Yeah. So. How important is that your LinkedIn profile be a reflection of your resume? Is that, uh, is that a key driver, especially now that everybody's virtually employed and virtually conducting interviews? Well, it has to match. Yes, it has I, to match. <laughs> I see these resumes come over and then I look up at LinkedIn and they don't match. I, I'm, I'm with I'm with Gina on this. I see that all the time. And it's like, wait, this doesn't go here. This doesn't go there. What, I don't understand. You know, I don't want to read between the lines and try to figure it out. I want to see. I want to see that correlation. Right. If yeah. I can chime in there, the thing about LinkedIn is that many many recruiters, um, you know, on the or hiring managers, I should say, on the company side, are hanging out there. And so if your information is inaccurate and they've received your resume, that could disqualify you for sure. The other thing is that if you are updating your resume, make sure you're updating your LinkedIn profile um, as well. And then last tip about that is there's places in LinkedIn where you can store your resume. And unless your resume is really spot on, I would not store it. I would make sure that you submit it each time you're applying mm -hmm. for a position. Great because tip. If, yes, that's if great they tip. see things that are that don't match what they're looking for, that pesky little ATS system. I know we're going to talk about that later. Um, if they see it before they you've even applied to the job, you've been kicked out of the pool before you even know it. So don't give them more than what you have most current. Yeah, good, good point. Um, kind of want to talk about education uh, because somebody asked this question, um, and 
and, and I'll give my comment. Of course, I'm not a professional uh, recruiter, so you guys are the final word here. But I think that there is a balance between experience and education, right? At some point, education means less um, and ed experience means more. And in the beginning stages, maybe it's the other way around. So um, help me or help our listeners kind of figure out, you know, when do you focus on college? And if you haven't completed college, do you still mention you attended part, part of the years or one year or two years? Um, how do you how do you think that we should position that from a resume perspective? College for the travel industry, especially for, you know, many folks have been around for a long time. I mean, when you got into travel, you kind of started your way at the bottom and worked your way up and you maybe went to travel school. Maybe you had a, an associate's degree. Maybe you didn't. So, you know, many of us in this, this age group, you know, um, have had a difficult time with that. Uh, for the most part, the jobs in the travel industry don't really require you to have a college degree. Um, however, as you get up higher level types of positions, they do they do want that. However, I have seen some people who have been really very, very successful um, without a college degree who have really worked their way all the way up at the top. I think it depends upon the company. But as far as putting it on your resume, if you have some college or whatever you have an education, just put it down. You don't have to, you know, unless you're asked point blank about it, um, you know, you can you can explain, I went to school for one year, you know, or you just put down that college, you're not putting an end date, you know, as far as the date that you graduated, mm -hmm. you know, so, but I certainly would put it down. Um, you know, what do you think, Gina? Yeah, so I, I do agree with that. Um, but also in regards to education, if you're a CTC, any other additional education, I was just chiming on in the no high school piece because nobody really wants to know when you graduated high school. Um, so anything that you're proud of and want to add to your resume, you should add it from an educational standpoint. Yeah. And, um, and I think that all of us uh, during the course of our um, jobs have experienced some sort of a certification process, uh, you know, whether it's a Sabre skill set or a GDS type of a, a skill set improvement. Um, I think sometimes we forget about those things, right, because they're not really that important. But mentioning them, um, uh, you know, because that's education for sure, right? So you want to, you want, it doesn't always have to be the traditional college, in my opinion. I agree. Yes, I, I definitely agree. Um, but but having the the various different types of technology programs on your resume, I mean, I how often have I received a resume from a corporate travel agent who doesn't have a GDS on their system? I'm like, OK, so what do you do like and how do you do it? You know, um, and they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot to put that on there. I'm like, it's so important. Or I received a resume the other day from somebody for a CVent job who had the experience on CVent, but it wasn't on a resume. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to know that if you don't have it on your resume? And she's like, right. and she's explaining it to me. So that's so important to put the relevance of, of technology platforms um, on, on your resume um, it's, and, and put it in multiple, multiple different places. And, and back to what Gail was saying earlier, um, for, for instance, for me, so I, I, I get a job order and I'm looking for a candidate. I'm gonna send them the job description. So tailor your resume to the job description, mm. pull out those key pieces, put it on your resume so it stands out. Yeah, It needs to stand out. Yeah. I mean, I would even recommend customizing each resume for the position I that you're applying absolutely for. Absolutely agree. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like the same same resume you send everywhere, right? Because absolutely if, the resume, agree with if the job description requires uh, and mentions that they want somebody who is a who's experienced salesperson, you want to make sure you say, I'm an experienced salesperson, right? I mean, it's that simple. And, um, and, that simple. Simple. and quantify numbers in there as far as sales, yeah, like what, what type of sales and what were the, what were the dollars you brought in? What was your portfolio? All that, every, everything, all has to tie together yeah. to be that package, yeah. um, and um, that's what's the most important thing about tying together with job descriptions. Because how often, again, we get a a, a candidate and we'll say, "Listen, I, you're telling me you've done this. I can see kind of that you've done that, but you really have to say it. You have to say it. And you have to spell it out in your resume." And we, I have to see it, and then they make these little changes here and there, or whatever. But it just, this doesn't like I'm looking at it and saying, OK, where's the changes? So it's you it really have to tailor your resume to every job description. It'll help you get the foot in the door. 
In today's world, are spelling errors forgivable mistakes? <laughs> no. A, uh, a Never. No. 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 Okay. okay. Um, and obviously, you can use things like Word, and it'll tell you your, your spelling is <laughs> mistake. You know, mm -hmm. yes. mistake here, right? So, um, and 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 Word even has resume templates. How important is it to have like a pretty resume with there's a border around it? And you know, I um, like border. I like border. tracking systems. App. So a lot of these applicant tracking systems, when they get parsed into a system, they get this. They'll they'll get all gobbledygook. So your, your borders, your prettiness, this, that, and the other thing just kind of goes by the wayside and, and like all of a sudden it's been reformatted. Um, so I think the best thing is the simple, you know, the resume that speaks what you do um, and not having all the specialty borders. And that that's my personal opinion. Other people may like the way it looks, but, you know, from uh, my perspective, I just like a simple, simple resume. All right. So let's talk about where where you should look for a job, um, and um, and you know where can you go? Obviously, uh, you know I mean I mean I mean what do you uh, what do you both uh, you know ask or say to people that they should be talking to? Um, okay, so as far as um, all right, so as far as job boards, I mean obviously the job boards are out there. I mean we own hot travel jobs. People can parse their resume on there. Companies can come in and and I mean we have some travel companies that that's all they use is our is our job board because they're always finding. You know good candidates on there um so job boards um you know job boards and one of the reasons why i started hot travel job is because i i you know i used to advertise with monster and indeed and everything else and i found every other person out there except travel people right you know, i had people who wanted to travel so it was just like so that was back in 2008 when we did that so you know um you know job boards are certainly way to go but they have to be specific to that industry so um, so that's basically, you know, enough and, there, and there's a ton of different job boards, but they are specific. So that's, uh, so then recruiters, go ahead, Gina. Oh no. Well, of course recruiters, because we Yay. can kind of guide you along the way. I mean, that's a given, um, <laughs> but, but there are jobs out there that we don't get. I mean, unfortunately <laughs> we don't get all the jobs that are available out there. We would love it if we did, right? Yeah, of course. But that's when you turn to a LinkedIn <laughs> or you go to company websites but also the key is the networking piece. Network, use your network. Go back to old bosses, old directors. Go back to anybody that you've touched. If you see a job advertised at Joe's Travel, find out who works at Joe's Travel if that's a job you really want to pursue. Do your homework. That is the key. Do your due diligence and finding as much information out about the company and about the position and who works there and, and, and network. Don't be lazy. That's the big, that's the takeaway from this. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy with your resume or how you approach things and how you approach your search. I mean, finding a job is almost like having a job because it's your, it's your everyday job. You come to your desk and you work at getting a job. So it's not, you know, it's not a blase thing. You have to, you, and it's unfortunately in today's, you know, um, area that we're in, you know, that's what you need to do is you need to basically treat this as a job to find yourself a job. You know, and you might find more about yourself than what you know. Yeah, um, I've heard the phrase "your network is your net worth" um, in the past, so that's something I'd like to throw out there. Um, mm -hmm. um, and 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 I think that sometimes, um, you know, I mean, I mean, you take something like LinkedIn, right? Um, you know, sometimes people wait until they need a job to go to LinkedIn. Um, you know, you should be on LinkedIn during your job um, and talking to people, networking with people. Um, in my humble opinion, uh, you know, some people sometimes people like to make their LinkedIn profile like their personal friend circle. Um, I don't, you know, there's other tools for that. Right, you don't need to make that yeah. LinkedIn should be truly professional, uh, reaching out to companies that you might want to work for in the future, and and just getting their feed coming in and learning about them over a period of time. I think all those things help you build a network um, uh, that uh, maybe even be of people you never met before and and never will meet until until that day when when you're looking for a position and now you've connected with this person over a period of time and you can say, hey, John, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if there's any role in your organization for me. So you know, previous employers and colleagues, I think sometimes. People People forget about their previous colleagues because they leave the company and then they don't connect with them anymore. Um, I think that those are all great uh, ways to um, get connected again. I agree. Yes, absolutely. All right. So let's talk about the interview um, and, uh, and, and some of the things that are happening. So what changes have you seen in the interview process that's occurring these days as a result of the pandemic? Obviously, there's huge, huge changes there. 
Yes, um, the video, video video interviewing is really, really, really taken hold. Um, even before the pandemic, I noticed some companies out there that were doing uh, video, um, actually videos prior to being interviewed, um, they would have various different questions and you'd have to sit there and, you know, and look at the screen and answer the questions and quite nerve wracking for a lot of people. Very, very nerve wracking, especially when you're you're not used to, um, to speaking and, um, you know, it's um, it, it's definitely tough. So that's a big thing. The telephone interviews. I mean, obviously, telephone interviews have been around for a long time. But you know, telephone interviews can be difficult as well. I mean, you don't see the body language of that other person on the other side. You know, you know what you're saying, but you don't know what they're thinking. You know, so you know, it's and uh, on body language is an important thing. You know, so video. Um, you know, they can basically see body language. They can see how that you handle yourself, how you speak. You know, um. Another thing that companies I've seen are doing is um, writing skills. They want to see how people can write. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. writing skills are very important. Um, you know, you have to know where you put your commas and your punctuations and everything else like that. So that's another important thing that they're asking for is sample writing skills. Um, and during, maybe, maybe not during an interview, but maybe as a process. Um, let's see. And make sure with, with video is that you practice, you know, Practice is the key. Uh, you make sure the lighting is right. You make sure that uh, you know you don't have uh, people around you yelling and screaming, kids, dogs barking, and everything. So it's um, you know that's very important too. You know, but uh, video, telephone, uh, in person, not so much. But then if they're looking for in person people to work in their office, sometimes I, people in. You know, so um, I, it'll it'll come back. That part will come back. So what I've seen in addition, you know, to the video interviews is once they've conducted a video interview and they like the candidates, there's a lot of skills assessments these days. It, it's, it's interesting. I have a couple clients that really they start with a GDS test and then like Gail said, a skills area, uh, writing skills. And they really want to make sure that they hire the top talent because right now there's a lot of talent out there. So they're really picking and choosing what they're doing. Um, but be ready. I apologize. My phone ringing. Um, but be ready for a skills assessment. And along, along with the, the, sorry, Ash, to interrupt, but along with the interviews, you know, once you finish your interviewing, they're going to talk about references. When you provide your references, it is key to put down that you work for who you work for. No friends, of course titles, their contact information. Don't just give people their names and phone numbers. How do you know this person? And and they really want prior leaders, prior managers, prior directors. But but put it in a, in a professional um, email. Who they are, what they you know, how you know them, um, and their contact information. How often we get you know references, and it's just a name or a phone number or an email address, and we have no idea who they are. Or it's just a pie in the sky. So it's just so important that you put that information down as for, in, in references. If I could just chime in with references, just to take it a step further. If you have someone who, from your past who is a really great reference, maybe a past boss or a colleague. Um, even if it's, uh, you know, if you had a direct contact with a client who's willing to give you that reference, um, it's great to have that reference, but it's great to have the referral, add those referrals or ask them to do those referrals on LinkedIn. Because mm -hmm. if they're looking yes. at your profile, mm -hmm. they want to see, oh, they're connected to this person. And, you know, that's a great way to help build your network too. Great point, Michelle. That's great. Very, very, very good. Um, what are some tips if I get nervous in an interview? So all of a sudden I'm in the interview and you know the, the, the people are there in front of me and I'm like sweating bricks or freaking out. What do I do? Okay, so my favorite thing, and I'm sorry to interrupt everybody, but I tell people now, especially now, gosh, I haven't interviewed in 10 years. Then tell them that. Tell them I'm a little bit nervous. Be human. Yeah. Because if they're not forgiving and, and you're not comfortable, you don't want to work for them. Good point. <laughs> interview right. them too, right? You uh -huh. gotta interview them, but be human and just put it out there. And I, I don't like the word transparent, but be very transparent about it. Right. Look, guys, I haven't interviewed in twenty years. I'm a nervous wreck. Right. Go easy on me. <laughs> and, and and people will go easy on you if you say they that. Will. Exactly. <laughs> ah. Absolutely. You know, the, the other thing, the most important thing to remember is you're interviewing for a position, but 
you're also interviewing them for a company that you want to see that you're mm-hmm. working for. So remember, right. it's, you know, they have a need and you have a need. And so, yes, you in this situation where, you know, travel has been hurting so much and people I know are really um, anxious to get back to work uh, for many reasons. But just remember that the job is also you're interviewing them for the right fit for you. Yeah, but sometimes you get so desperate because it's the only interview yeah. you've got. So yeah, you no, that's true. Make, it's true. Make, but um, I think adjustments. that that if you could remember that mindset and yeah. just calm yourself, forget about that. Yeah, you are in that desperate. You know, it's that fight or flight um, uh, action in your body. To just kind of be in that space, it it will help calm you down. And you can do some. Uh, you know, you're doing everything on a video or Zoom these days, anyway. So you practice in in advance. You know, yeah. I mean, granted. Yeah not the you know or have a friend you know call up a friend and you do it because zoom is free you can go into zoom and um and do some practicing yeah. uh, i don't know if people realize that but you can i mean you can just go into open up a little zoom account it's free um you know send an invite to your friend and say hey i need some help here i'm going to be doing an interview and uh you know and your friend can um can help you out so and- so uh, go ahead michelle go ahead michelle Oh, no, it was I Gina. Think it was sorry. Oh, Gina. Gina. Sorry. <laughs> so, but but being prepared for the interview that should calm you a little bit. Know who you're interviewing with. Again, do your due diligence. Know the company. Know who you're interviewing with. Check them out. It's easy to find out information about companies and people. Yeah. So, do your homework and be prepared. Preparation is key. So how quickly should I send out my email of thanks after the interview? So I close the I close the browser. The Zoom the Zoom thing is closed on my computer. What's right away, like within that, that minute? If you're interested in the job, in my opinion, it just shows your enthusiasm. Maybe mm-hmm. Michelle and Gail might not agree with me, but I'm no, all about I, no, no, that, you know what? It, you know, it's all about enthusiasm. You know, yeah. how often people basically say, oh yeah, I interviewed with that company. Oh, yeah, it was good, but uh, you know, but they're not being, enthusiasm is so yeah. important. You know, wanting something and wanting and wanting and just be enthusiastic about it is just like, because they don't know exactly what you're feeling. So if you, as Gina just said, send it out immediately, absolutely. No, it's, the, it's the opposite of dating. Names. It's the opposite yeah. of dating. You have to wait. You have to wait <laughs> yeah, two yeah. Three no, days. Don't do that. But you should know their names, their titles. And a really great thing to do, a tip is to write the email in a draft, have it ready. And as soon as you close that call, boom, hit that send button. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to think about, oh, who did I speak to? You know, what was their name? You know, you should have all of that ready and then send that. uh, Thank you. Very important, Michelle, because there is more and more panel interviews. So you have everybody that. Yeah. And you forget. Did I talk to Joe or or Jeff or. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. And and a key is to kind of if you have to do it, you know, maybe even make the chart and say, okay, you know, Gina was sitting on the left hand, right hand side so that you have the visual. Um, all great tips for uh, sending back that communication. Okay, last question on this on this slide here. Um, if I don't hear back after my thank you into uh, my thank you email, how 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 much should I wait before I follow up? One week, two days. What's the best practice there? Nowadays, with the follow up, I think one of the biggest complaints that I hear from people, and I think Gina, you will agree with me. And this, this is maybe not so much interviewing with with people that the clients of ours, because as a recruiter. We have a. We will know sooner than when you're interviewing on your own, right? Yeah. So yeah. you know. But the biggest complaint that I hear from people is when they interview outside of not using a recruiter, they don't get the feedback. They just they're like um, they they never hear anything. You know why companies do that? I don't know, but it is um, it's something that's ongoing. But unfortunately, it's you know. But you can follow up as much as you want. But a lot of times, if they if they want you, they'll get back to you, um, and that's almost like the rule of thumb, which is really pretty sad. Especially so if they don't call you back, um, uh, they don't they didn't want you in the first place. Well, I hate, I hate yeah. to say that, but yeah. you know, it's, true. I mean? it's, it's like true. you have to read between the lines, and it's it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. But that's a that's a big complaint. People will say, "Hey, I never heard back from from you know so and so," or "I'm just waiting," and I try to, and then they and then the company might get back to them, and then they drag them on. You know, which is also not fair. We're gonna we're gonna call it um, ghosting company company ghosting. Yes, yes, yes. New yes. term. Perfect. All right, Michelle, Perfect. you're up you're up on this one here. So, um, you know, you're you're ready to negotiate. You got the job offer and the offer that you've been given financially. You're like, mm, I'm not really so sure about that. So, give us your thoughts on this. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, things have definitely changed. Um, salaries may not be what they used to be, um, but I think that you, you owe it to yourself if you've been in a certain situation to remember that, but also think about ways that you could be creative in negotiating with them. Now, you don't wanna be a hardball about it because you could talk yourself right out of the job, but maybe think of other things like, um, what is the opportunity for future negotiations um, when can, when are salaries revisited? We understand, you know, part of being in that interview is not just about regurgitating what's on your resume, but thinking with your head and your heart and, and coming through authentic. And so, you know, if you have more than one offer, that's amazing. Then you have a little bit more leverage to negotiate, but um, always know that you can negotiate something, even if it's for future. Great. Okay. Um, and so you got the job now, right? You, you, you're, you're back at work. Um, and then you're going to commit all the same mistakes that you committed the first time around, which is not a bunch right. of LinkedIn profile, not, <laughs> not, not do any of those things because you can yourself, you know, go back into the circle again. Yeah. Um, but you shouldn't, right, Michelle, what should you do? No. Well, one of the things that I've been hearing a couple of times lately, um, I did a workshop on time management and, uh, a woman was saying how, you know, her last boss never asked for a one-on-one -on -one, and all of a sudden she has a new boss and they're asking for a one-on-one -on -one conversation just to kind of check check in now this may not happen necessarily with agents on the floor uh, a lot but in other travel industry positions this could happen and so if you're not getting that feedback on where you are what are the goals what's your vision what's your mission to make sure you are aligned with what the companies are you should be putting your, your foot forward to ask those questions so that you show that you are engaged and that you are um, being intentional to be in this position and that you want to learn and grow. If you just sit back and do everything you did before and then all of a sudden they come over to you six months later and you have this horrific review, you go, what happened? You know, you, you need to have your eyes and ears open on what's happening. Might even be a good idea to look at who's, who stuck around through the, the pandemic, what's happened in the company, maybe get that mentor, maybe get, you know, part of a little community there because more and more we're all, you know, remote. So that coffee, water cooler conversation and being in the building is, is not as fluid as it used to be. So um, recommend that you put yourself forward and not wait for them to come to you if they're not doing that. Okay, good. Um, and then, um, and then, should you stay in touch with the recruiter that got you the job and thank them and appreciate them? <laughs> absolutely, Yay! absolutely. You know, um, you never want to forget about them afterwards, no, right? No, no. And and here's the thing, you know, if you have, you're going through that um, onboarding, and you know, we know some companies are doing a phenomenal job more so than others. That onboarding experience should last for quite some time to make sure that both parties are comfortable with that. And so staying with that recruiter is very important or staying with that, whoever the connection is that gave you, you know, that opportunity, because you want to, first of all, appreciate them. And number two, if things start to go a little awry, you want to have them in, in your corner again. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, Rian, if we can go to the next slide, um, cause we're coming up on the hour. Um, so we want to, uh, talk about um, what you should do while you wait. So you're applying for the jobs. You are, of course, um, you know, out there, you're, you're doing your thing. Um, but of course, these things take time. So, you know, if you're not working, what should you do while you wait, right? So we have some suggestions here. Um, and, 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 you know, all three of you, please feel free to chime in. Um, but I would say a couple of things, right? You want to make sure you stay informed about the travel industry. I think many people don't do a good job of that while they're in the travel industry, but then they do even worse when they're not in the industry. And now they've lost knowledge about what's happening and, and the changes. And the one thing I love about this industry, while I, well, the reason why I've been here for 25 years is that it's never the same. It will constantly change on you. It'll evolve on you beyond your imaginations, which makes it really exciting. But at the same time, it's very difficult to keep up with it, right? So you have to put that extra effort in from an education perspective and, and, um, and, and read and read and study and read and study and read the industry over and over again. I've said this to a thousand people in my lifetime, and I will continue to say it because I think that people just make the mistake of not being educated in their own industry. I agree. 
There's a lot Definitely of watch business, listen to business travel 360 podcast. Oh, there we go. Shameless oh, yes. plug. Yes, yes. Shameless plug. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, but it's good. I'm telling you. It I, really, uh, and I have to do that I because know. I'll be honest with you. I haven't been on one of your calls and I hear from Michelle tells me they're fantastic. So they, they're um, really good. Cause um, I'm liking, I mean, you're, you're a great speaker. You're great at what you're doing here. So I can just imagine how your 360 podcasts are. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> awesome. Definitely. <laughs> All right, let's put that aside. Let's talk about other things as well. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so basically, like learning, if you if you have an opportunity to take some courses or whatever, I mean, GPTA has some courses, um, Concur, Cvent, some of them you have to pay for, but you know, invest in yourself. I mean, I talked to a girl not that long ago who had such a great resume. I mean, she was just and such a great background, and I said to her, I said, you know what? You would be really, really good in learning CVent. I said, I see that your technology, you have a great technology background, but learn some other tools. Be specific, you know, because all of those tools, that's what companies want these days. They want people who can, who understand technology, who embrace technology, even though it gets a little harder every time because you're always learning a different program. But, you know, you know, I, I had a job order for a C-Vent person, and I'll tell you, I had the darndest time trying to find somebody to fill that role. Believe it or not, I have a lot of meeting planners, but C-Vent is something that, you know, um, learn it. Definitely learn it. Concur. Concur, you know, um, booking and um, uh, the other part of it, which is the, the uh, I don't Expense. know. The part Expense. Of it. Yeah, Expense. Thank you. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff is really, really good. And it adds to your resume and adds to your background, enhances the stuff that you know, you know, make yourself more marketable, you know, just don't go back to the same thing as what Michelle's just said, you know, you know, expand upon what you already have in your, in your toolbox and you'll be better suited, you know, to apply for those other jobs and to, to, to maybe grow within a company. So, um, that's all that I have to say about that. <laughs> Gina, Michelle, any comments on that, on, on this one? Just really I think, quick. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, okay, Michelle. Uh, really quick. Um, we talked about a lot of tools and technology, and I know it, earlier there was a comment about, you know, other uh, positions within the industry that have been impacted. And absolutely. Uh, a good way to kind of bundle that up, especially on the first page of your resume, is to use SAS because that is a key word in resumes. And so you can explain further down in your skills, but if you use SAS, uh, that's hot because you can transfer those skills, right? So if you were an agent, now you're looking to do something else, it shows that you have some, some uh, potential for growth or that you have uh, learned something else within the industry. Okay, um, I did. I, I took some notes about um, some strengths, right? And 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 I'll and I'll just kind of share this because I think strengths are transferable. Um, you have to know how to market those strengths. So if you're a travel agent, for example, of course you know how to book travel on the GDS or whatever you're using. Everybody knows that. But I would add words like schedule planning, crisis management, problem solving, going above and beyond. Right? <laughs> exactly. Those are things that you do, recovery. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, I mean, I mean, you do that. I mean, when, when the traveler calls you from the airport and says, I'm my flight's been canceled, that's crisis management, right? Crisis right. management 101. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I would use words like that. If you're a flight attendant, for example, and you want to talk about your skills, I would say organizing people, overcoming <laughs> difficult people um, and, and knowing how to manage a crisis, um, you know, like 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 a flight uh, having to land in an emergency. I mean, that's a crisis situation, in my opinion. So yeah. um, so I think sometimes people don't take what they do and apply them in other facets of mm -hmm. life, right? And right. I think that understanding how to do that um, is really, really important. And of course, um, all the three of you can help everybody on that as well. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, go ahead, Michelle, you were gonna say something? No, I was just going to say, sometimes the best thing to do, because you don't even realize all the great things that you do is to run your, have even a personal friend or a recruiter yeah. run by and ask you those questions. Somebody who personally knows you will, will ask, well, didn't you do this? And didn't you do that? Next thing you know, you go, yeah, I'm pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we have that self-doubt, that imposter syndrome, take all those skills, throw it out on the paper, and then start to ask those questions yeah. of where you are, where you can transfer those to. And if you're an account manager or sales executive, your strengths are overcoming objections, managing <laughs> existing uh, relationships, crunching numbers, analysis, right? So these are all words that I threw up just for yeah. this call. Project um, management, huge. Yeah, 
Yes, exactly. Perfect exactly. management is huge. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, with that, um, we are uh, wrapped up here, and I want to just thank everybody for joining today's session. Uh, we have some questions, Rian, if you want, wouldn't mind coming up, and uh, maybe we can hammer some of these open questions that are still out there. Um, but I just want to thank um, you, Gail, and you, Gina, and Michelle, for your time today. I hope everybody that joined today's session got something out of it. I hope you uh, learned at least one thing that you could do differently, and if you did, then it was worth your time uh, to be here. Yeah, before we do that, Ash, I just want to say thank you so much for you guys' time. I, there were so many similarities between what you guys told, talked about today and what we talked about on the more UK, European side of things. It was very, very, very interesting to see those. And you you all pointed out the importance of the key achievement section on a on a what we call a CV and what you call a resume, mm -hmm. right? Um, and people were saying you should also talk about things you've done outside the job because they make you as a person, right? If you've achieved something you're proud of, you should you should mention it. So um, that was interesting. And the stuff you've just talked about there, um, Ash, the way to talk about your skills, people undersell themselves and don't think about how, how good they are, what they do. And we've heard from somebody who said they specifically are looking for people from the travel industry because they are so multi-skilled. Um, so don't forget about that. So great job, guys. Um, I have a little bit of time. I don't know if you do. We technically are ending the session, but there are some questions. So just tell me which ones you think you want to address, and we can do that if you have the time. Um, yeah. Um, let's see here. I want to just go through. Um, uh, somebody asked uh, yeah. if colleges have alumni job services. I think it, I think the answer to that will just depend on the college and how big they are, right? I think um, most state schools probably have a job alumni sure, services. Yeah, go ahead, Gina. No, they do. They do. You just got to check with your university that you attended. I don't. I don't think it's a general. There's a general answer for that, but I'm sure that most most universities do. Um, and if you need any LinkedIn support, by the way, I'm going to do a plug here. Um, Rian hosts a LinkedIn training session every Wednesday on Clubhouse, right? So if you Google, um, not Google, if you follow Rian on um, on uh, the LinkedIn um, uh, session here that you're on today, um, you can just find him under the speakers tab and you'll be able to connect to him. Uh, but uh, every Wednesday he offers LinkedIn training. It's a phenomenal room to be in because he'll actually pull up your profile and tell you things uh, that you need to work on. So um, there's a lot of uh, other things out there, but I'm going to uh, say that you should definitely join Reins. I've joined that number of times and it's very, very helpful. And I, I thank you. I should also want to say that we actually learn from each other. That's actually the better part of it. We learn because we encourage people to say what worked for you this week and we share it. And it's, it's just really nice. Again, that community spirit and travel really comes through in that session. So yeah, we try and do it on a Wednesday. Thanks for that. What, what time is that at? It's 4 p.m. UK, so whatever that is. 11, 11, 11 Eastern. Yes, 11 Eastern. 11, okay. Unless we have a different room and then Rian has to move it to 10. That's right. I, I accommodate for Ash. <laughs> All right. I think um, that's it. Um, and, and by the way, for all of you... Um, so oh, here's one, a question. One more question from, from, yeah. from Pat. Yeah, if you have a, a group interview, do you send an individual follow-up or to the entire group? I would say individual. What do you say, Gail? Individual. I, I, I'm sorry, I was reading some of this stuff. What, what was the question if, again? Yeah, if you if you're interviewing a group of if you're being interviewed by a group of people, do you mm -hmm. send the follow up to just that one person who set up that call, or just everybody that's on that call? Uh, just to that individual. Okay. Different opinions. Interesting. And here's a, here's a suggestion maybe, from, maybe from no, Michael. Maybe there's no perfect answer to that, right? I think it's just a matter of how how well you I feel. I mean, to that individual, response. and then maybe the other individual as well. I think it. Yeah. I think that's kind of like it. It depends upon what exactly. Um, I, I usually like to just try to keep it separate. Yeah. Yeah. And great suggestion by Michael here. Um, you can set up Google alerts for a tra for travel or whatever verticals. LinkedIn also allows you to do job That's alerts, right. um, so you could do that as well. Um, and job alerts are great because they kind of uh, uh, you know provoke you to applying as well. So yeah. it's like you get the alert, you're like, oh, I got to look at this, yeah. right? And next Take thing you know, action. you're applying for jobs. So yeah. um, follow the companies you're interested in on LinkedIn. Absolutely, um, yeah. there are groups that you can join in LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a lot of learning classes that you could do. Mm -hmm. You can sign up for premium for 30 days for free. So take advantage of that. Um, yeah. Join those professional groups because there's a lot of job postings in there too. 
And um, Marcy is asking about the link. Um, Marcy, they, it varies because it's on Clubhouse. We might actually, big reveal, we might move it to this platform, Ooh. but uh, we'll see. Uh, if, you just, if you just connect to me on LinkedIn, Marcy, I do post them when, when they go up. We do them, you know, Tuesdays is the, the Business Travels 360 News, Wednesdays is LinkedIn, and then sometimes on a Thursday we do an industry topic. But uh, just yeah. connect to me and you'll see the adverts there. So um, thank you. And I do want to end today's session by reminding everybody um, how I got my first job, and that was by looking at the New York Times Health Wanted section um, on, the, on the actual newspaper um, and going down. And at that time, the, the ads used to be like two lines because every letter was a cost item. So it would be like, travel agent wanted help uh, or, or fax number. And that was it. You didn't even know what company you were applying to, so you applied to it and you hope for the best. Um, and then you had to sit by your phone and answer it because if they called yes. you, um, you didn't have a cell phone, um, so you had to answer the phone. So anyway. How far have we come in the We've recruitment come really, space? really far. Yeah. I still yeah. have a whole bunch of facts. For, I had resumes for like 20 years up in the archives. They were all fax paper. Finally, like a couple of years ago, I got a company and just got rid of everything because there must have been, oh my God, there must have been like 30 boxes of, of, <laughs> of fax resumes. I still have them all. You wow. do? I have them all. No, no, no. I, I have fouls and fouls and fouls. I had to separate myself from that. <laughs> I maybe maybe, maybe you can um, build a house with all that paper. <laughs> um, all right. So with that, I think we're we're wrapping up. We're now. We are. Oh, uh, I just okay. want to add one more thing yeah. that uh, you know we need to keep in mind, given the fact that this is uh, mental health awareness. That um, yes. there's also a lot of strain on the recruiters themselves, and we thank you guys for being so. You know, you talked about it right at the start. You know, giving so much help for people and being there to support them. You're not just finding them a job, you are helping them in their lives. And it came out so strongly in the previous session. We think we should be hosting a session called Recruiters Are Human, are also human. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. I'm, I'm about, being very serious stickers? about it. How about bumper stickers? I love my recruiter. <laughs> we are going to do it because I think, you know, we need to, we need to have that discussion um, about how far things have come in that space as well. So thank you for the great job you guys are also doing. And not a lot of it is seen. Not all of the scene. So yeah. there we go. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. And, and, and to that point, I'd like to uh, offer a tip, right? I think I think it's important that your recruiter knows you better than just your resume, right? So you yes. want to make sure that <laughs> yeah. when they're looking for jobs, they're going to look for the people that they remember the most. So that's uh -huh. right. That you want to just keep that's that in true. check. That's right. right. Thank Gail, you for everybody who's. Yes, yep. sorry. Thank Ash. you, Gail, Gina, Michelle, and Rian. Really appreciate you putting all this together. Thank you. No, Ash, no, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. If the, if the panel can just stay on the screen, uh, we're going to do an exit video, and I'll catch you at the other end of it. But thank you so much, and thanks, Ash, for hosting. Thank you. All right. Yes, this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.